Acapulco, Mexico. This is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a great guest coming in. His name is Bala Subramanian. I hope I said that right. He said I can just call him Bala. Uh, I don't know why the names are so long in India, uh, but he lives in <laughs> India. He lives in Chennai, India. And uh, uh, very interesting guy. He's an entrepreneur. He started up a whole uh, chain of uh, schools in India because he was very unhappy with how the school system was there. And he has a very interesting take on how to do education. Uh, he's also, of course, an anarchist and he lives in India. And th that's really interesting, especially because, well, India is so interesting to begin with. Uh, but just recently, they canceled uh, the 500, I believe, and 1,000 rupee note, which were the two biggest uh, notes in in India, that'd be the equivalent of the U.S. canceling the $150 bill overnight, uh, ca uh, causing a massive amount of chaos in India right now. So this is very interesting. Uh, so we want to get his take on that. And also life in India, what's going on in India, because such such an interesting place. Uh, before we get into all that, Bala, I got to ask you, how did you become an anarchist? Uh, hi, Jeff. First of all, thanks for this great uh, discussion. Uh, my journey into anarchism started uh, quite a few, long time ago. I used to be, uh, to begin with, I was more of an objectivist. And I had read almost all the works of Ayn Rand and I was a firm believer in uh, uh, many of the, the basic concepts of natural rights and uh, individual uh, liberties. The concept of individual rights was something very deep uh, in my psyche. Uh, but somewhere around uh, uh, 2007, uh, I wandered into... Uh, the environments of the Ludwig von Mises Institute and uh, online of course and uh, I used to get into a lot of arguments with uh, people on various issues and one issue that I was getting stuck on was this whole concept of government. I, that was the first time I encountered a few uh, anarchists and uh, there was a particular discussion I remember very well where uh, it was more like an epiphany for me and uh, it, it struck me that something was fundamentally wrong with the way Ayn Rand had presented the whole argument for the existence of a government. And specifically, uh, it's, it struck very deep when I started thinking about the concept of um, uh, IP, intellectual property. And that's uh, where it, uh, it, it sort of dawned on me. That you could see the scales fell from my eyes and I realized that a lot of what I've been told was rubbish and I had to just keep it aside and look at the whole world with new eyes, you could say that, you could say so. So that's how I reached that position and then I went on to read more and that was when I decided that um, I need to know more. So I stepped a lot into economics of the Austrian school, though I'm not formally educated. I've read all, uh, all the key works and I understand them very well. I even, I am also an um, one of the investors in a small B school in India, in Bangalore, and I have been teaching economics there for the last five years. I do a very different program the, from the Austrian perspective. I do not touch upon any other mainstream ideas. So that's how I got, as I got deeper into it, I realized that uh, there is a deep connection between uh, the economics and the ethics. You really, it's not that you can't separate, they are, they operate in different realms, but they go together and uh, that's when I realized that it all makes sense. It makes much more sense than the standard arguments for the state. And that was for me the culmination. After there was no going back and I had to for life be uh, confirmed anarcho-capitalist as I like to call myself. Yeah, and it sounds like you are an anarcho-capitalist. You uh, have started up a chain of schools there in India. Why don't you tell us uh, why you did that and, and what it's all about? Okay, um, see, I started my career in 99 in the alternate education space, in the test prep space. And I was uh, training well over 5,000 students every year for some of the top, uh, most sought after examinations in India. Um, like for the IIMs or the Indian Institutes of Management, which are the premier institutes of management, edu management education in India. And what I could see was that, you know, it was sad that... Uh, Students were coming to me after com finishing their engineering education and they didn't know the basics of 7th and 8th grade mathematics. <laughs> it was really sad. You don't expect engineers to uh, walk into you and ask you to teach them that. And uh, I mean, they couldn't read even if the life depended on it. I mean, they couldn't read a paragraph and make sense of it. 
and logic was something completely uh, out of the outside the curriculum they never had any exposure to that wow. and it, i felt very sad when i saw that and i thought there was something more that we could do and over time we also started working with school children as part of the program and when we saw that there was a lot of potential children learn well if you teach them well and that's why that's when my wife and i we were both in that business together we decided that we should step out at least partially and start something so we started with the preschool in uh, in 2009 and now we have a couple, three three centers and we started a great school in uh, one part of chennai it's uh, now picking up it's picking momentum become momentum and uh, that's where we are now so that's how we got into it it's just a sad state of affairs in uh, education in india where children were not learning anything after 12 years they learned hardly anything so <laughs> sounds like the us a little bit <laughs> but oh, maybe even worse i'm sure it's, i'm from the stories i've heard tell me it's like not very different out there too <laughs> yeah it's sort of on purpose i think the, you know the government's involved in the school systems and they don't want people to learn logic anything really <laughs> they, they they mostly absolutely yeah. absolutely <laughs> so i'm glad to hear that you're uh doing it privately and trying to help some people and uh, uh indian to me is, is just fascinating i've been there i've actually been to chennai i went there by accident um or actually I didn't really even know where I was going. I was actually in Sri Lanka. I was in uh Colombo uh and I woke up and I had been uh, partying. I, this is back when I used to travel the world and just party a lot uh like 10 years ago. And um I woke up and I was really kind of hungover and I didn't want to go to the airport. And I turned on the TV and it said, "Oh, the uh the Tamil Tigers have just bombed the airport." And I was like, "Yes, I'm sure it'll be closed for a few hours, so I, I'm sure my flight will be delayed. Uh so I'm going to go back to sleep." So I went back to sleep. I woke up around noon and I thought okay I'll go to the airport and see what's going on and I went and I said oh uh, here's my flight to I was going to go to I believe Mumbai or Bombay and um I said, "Oh no, it left a few hours ago." And I said, "Oh, why wasn't the uh, airport being bombed then?" And she said, "Yeah, but that happens all the time, so it was fine." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh." <laughs> I said, "So what's your next flight?" And she said, "Chennai." And I'd never heard of it. And for me people, I believe it used to be called Madras, is that right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I didn't I heard of Madras, but I never heard of Chennai. So they changed a lot of the names in India. And um and so I'm on the plane going to a place I didn't even know where it is and I got there I got to the hotel and I'm trying to look up on they didn't even have Google Maps back then so I'm on like MapQuest or something trying to find out where I am uh and then uh yeah so I stayed there for a couple of days so I have been to Chennai but uh and then I went to uh Mumbai after that and uh to me India as a person born in you know sort of what you call the west uh, Canada US place like that uh it's one of the most fascinating places in the world it's just there's nothing you can't really get your head around what's going on there so why don't you as a an arco capitalist sort of explain to people just generally what's going on in India from your perspective um see uh in India this um this last ever since the last election there's been a lot of hope and uh, hype going around and uh, in general um, from an anarcho capitalist perspective uh, i would say that it's a very mixed mixed picture very confusing picture where uh, we really aren't clear uh, what exactly is the direction that things are headed in there is a lot of talk about um, um, governance being made uh, more effective and streamlined and all that on the other hand we see the other side where um a lot of things are getting more draconian like for example this very uh, cash um, uh, demonetization drive um to someone like me it looks quite scary in terms of uh, what uh, they trying to do there seems to be a very uh, strong move towards making uh, uh, greater surveillance and greater um uh, outreach I, i don't know, i don't know if you want to call it outreach but they're reaching into our pockets and into our uh, all our resources of data they want to know everything about us uh, like uh, a few years ago they started off this whole thing called the aadhar card the aadhar card is supposed to be a single identity card which is supposed to contain all information about you um, by the way i still haven't taken my aadhar card i've refused to take it on principle till they put a gun to my head and say you got no option but to take it you can't live your life if you don't have your aadhar card so i've not taken it because i as in my eyes it's perfect it's complete financial surveillance and not just financial it's complete surveillance so i've decided on on principle not to take it but that is a scheme that they started and right there it was very clear that there is a clear move towards um, greater supervision of the citizenry and in order to keep them in line 
So that's something that uh, as an anarcho-capitalist uh, scares me. Uh, while there's a lot of talk going on about the government being more business friendly and all that, uh, it hasn't really reflected in the key policies that matter, like in the areas of taxation. We still pay about uh, more than 50% of our income as taxes of various forms. Though on paper it doesn't look so big if you just count all the taxes, the taxes we pay on the goods, on the goods and services. If you, if you just count all the taxes that we pay, it amounts to more than 50% of all that we earn. And uh, it's only getting worse, as I see it. Yeah, sounds almost as bad as the U.S. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this rupee thing, though, is uh, fascinating, especially for people who kind of understand economics, uh, which you do, uh, and I, I do uh, fairly well as well as Austrian economics, uh, to see them canceling the two biggest sort of fiat currency notes just overnight. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about what they did and what the repercussions have been so far? Okay. Um, I'll probably touch upon the background to that, the reasons they give for this. See, India has a large uh, cash economy. A large number of transactions happen in cash. And uh, some of these are normal day-to-day -day transactions, and some of these are uh, transactions that happen, you could say, uh, in the background, the black economy, in, in, in an underground economy. The uh, free market. People, uh, yeah, of course, of course, it's all the free market. What they, I, I know that they like to use the word black to blacken the name of anyone who does something that they don't agree with. Right. So... Uh, the thing is, uh, there are areas where large amounts of cash get uh, rotated, it goes from hand to hand and it facil facilitates many transactions. And one big area where cash is used tremendously is the real estate sector. In India, uh, it's, it's anybody, I've, I've spoken to people who, who say it's, it's, it's very difficult to comprehend the real estate business in India. And part of the reason is that a large amount of the um, of any a large part of the value of any transaction happens in cash, and this happens because there are differences between um, they call they call in in Tamil Nadu they call it the guideline value. That's the official rate at which land shall be, land exchange shall be registered, and you pay a percent of it as stamp duty and uh, registration charges. So to minimize that, people keep the guideline value as low as possible. The government revises it periodically. But land prices are usually uh, significantly higher than that. So that difference is what goes out as a cash payment. So it could be anything from 50% uh, of the actual price of the land to 150 or even 200% of the price of the land. That's the amount of cash that gets uh, dealt. That's one area where large amount of uh, cash transactions happen. Another area which is uh, also quite big is the sector of uh, lubrication. Uh, by lubrication, I mean you lubricate the garment machinery, which is getting in your way of doing uh, business. They call it corruption out here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a pretty big thing. Um, in, in fact, uh, it's impossible to get a normal uh, building plan. Let's say you, you want to raise, a, I, I had to raise my school building, and it's absolutely impossible to get a simple plan approval for a building unless you pay large amounts in cash to various government officials at various levels. And all that constitutes a large part of what, again, what we call the, uh, the free market economy or what they call the black economy. So a large amount of cash gets transacted. And all this becomes revenue, in, income that's not declared and the government doesn't get its tax revenue. On top of it, there is also the other angle which they say where uh, there is a lot of counterfeit uh, notes coming in from out beyond the country's borders, which is primarily used to fund terrorism. Uh, it's a different matter who the biggest terrorist in this territory is, but then uh, they claim that it's used to fund uh, terrorist activities, especially in Kashmir. And uh, this move was basically, it, it's claimed to be an attack on uh, these two, these two things. One is the counterfeiting of currency that's coming from abroad, and the other is the black economy. They want to hit at the root of the black economy and reduce the number of cash transactions, bring more income on board, and thus be able to tax more income and therefore raise government's tax revenue significantly. This is the uh, stated objective of this. Uh, uh, demon they call it a demonetization out here. And this demon demonetization is apparently for these purposes, to reduce the number of cash transactions make them bring them on record and raise government's tax revenue. This is the 
basic idea behind this. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> very interesting uh, what's going on. And I've heard that, uh, well, like I said earlier, it, it'd be like in the U.S. if just overnight Obama, or I guess now Trump, uh, just came out and said uh, the $50 bill and $100 bill will no longer be accepted anywhere you have until December 30th to turn it into the banks. Uh, when you turn into the banks, you have to show up with your ID. Uh, and of course, if you're turning in a large amount, you're probably going to get investigated for all tax evasion, all these sort of things. Uh, but on top of that, and this is even the more crazy part, there is right now no other bigger note. So the biggest note um, <coughs> is the 100 rupee, which is worth about a dollar or two. <coughs> um, uh, they're talking about bringing out a 2,000, but I've heard, also heard that none of the ATM machines in India are able to <laughs> deal with those. So this is just like complete chaos. And I, I've seen lineups uh, down the block in, in all parts of India uh, for people just trying to get cash, trying to exchange their cash. Uh, what's, what's going on right now? Yeah, it, that situation is exactly as you described. It's uh, quite a difficult one. There are, um, I mean, I had this personal experience just two days ago. I was like looking to desperately for some cash because I had to get some stuff for my daughter's birthday party. And these are things you get only in cash at the local stationers. But um, every ATM, I just kept walking and walking, but every single ATM was shuttered down and the banks were closed by the evening. So there was no way of taking out uh, any cash. And uh, even at as late as uh, nine, at, nine at night, Nine, 9 in the evening, there were people standing in queues outside the uh, ATMs and it took only a, I mean it took only the time for my shopping to, for the queue to disperse because the ATM had run out of money. This is a common occurrence. They put in some money, as you rightly said, it's only the 100 rupee notes that are in circulation right now and by the time a few people um, withdraw their requirement, um, the others, uh, the machine runs out of money and the rest have to look for a different ATM. And uh, there, there are also limits on how much money you can withdraw on a single day. Um, they, they even This applies both to exchange of the large denomination notes that you have, as well as uh, new withdrawals. Like I had gone to my bank to withdraw cash. And I was told that until all this settles down, uh, there's going to be a limit of 20,000 rupees per month that I can withdraw as cash. And uh, th that's, that's a limit that they've put on my withdrawals from my account. That is one part. And if I'm going to exchange notes, they've put a limit of only 4,000 rupees for a person at a time. And that can be done only once every two days. I mean, only on alternate days. You can't do it every day. So they put a lot of restrictions. Okay, you could deposit it in your bank account, but you, there, there are limits on how much you can um, take smaller denomination notes off. So that's the way they're restricting it. And there are a lot of uh, people uh, quite anxious because people need cash. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't, people want to buy, uh, say, flowers for um, a, a puja. We call it a puja, the, it's a prayer, you do, it's a prayer. They want to buy flowers to perform a prayer and you, you don't give them a large denomination note. The flowers cost a small amount. So there are a lot of such transactions. When they buy groceries or vegetables for their home, they need cash because these are not people who deal with uh, credit cards or debit cards or other forms of electronic payment. And so it doesn't work in those sectors. I mean, I have this person coming to my doorstep selling me a little bit of uh, small quantities of different vegetables and the bill comes to 120 rupees. That lady doesn't walk around, walk around with these electronic payment options. So I've got to deal with cash. Or when I get a pizza delivered to my house for a party, I've got to pay in cash. So these, there are a lot, uh, there are a number of transactions that actually work only in cash. And when people need all that cash and there is a lot of um, belt tightening, temporary belt tightening happening out here, trying to avoid expenses so that you don't run out of cash. And people are conserving it for very um, important and urgent needs that may crop up at any time. Yeah, I've heard like uh, many stores, uh, th there's just no one shopping right now. Like it's really just almost shut down the entire economy uh, to an extent. Um, I know that in, 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 in India, sorry, in India, uh, the uh, a lot, many people are, uh, usually store gold as a, as a store of wealth. So that's a very good thing. So a lot of people have that. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about that and then we'll get into uh, Bitcoin as well. But talk a little bit about the gold culture in India and, and how that affects things. Okay. Uh, in India, the gold culture is actually very, very deep rooted. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, the most, uh, the, the best symbol of that is um, the Indian wedding, especially the Hindu wedding, where the bride is uh, adorned with a lot of gold jewelry. 
the whole tradition started off actually i mean when as i understand it in the olden days uh, there was the, fam- the 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 girl after marriage would go to her um, the groom's household they would move there and when they were going there uh, this this gold jewelry was actually the family's way of dividing up the wealth and giving the girl the daughter her share which she would not be able to reclaim as in when the parents uh, die and the property is divided up among the remaining children the, the woman doesn't remain there so it was the means of gifting to the daughter her fair share of the family's wealth so that's how it came about and um, it's it's a big thing i mean people it's large quantities of gold are consumed in all these weddings and families also have this culture of buying up a little gold at various points in time there are festivals that celebrate uh, the buying of gold you might have heard of this festival called akshaya tritiya it's a time which is supposed to be highly auspicious for the buying of gold so on that day people rush to buy some gold if what about the quantity it's considered to be auspicious if you buy some gold on that day and this is surge always on the day of akshaya tritiya so there are these days there are many festivals where people consider it again auspicious to buy some gold so the gold buying culture is quite strong uh, in fact uh, the gold holding culture is also quite strong you could and uh, the best uh, example i have of that is that when the government tried gold bonds a little while ago i mean the way it fell flat i mean i was just laughing my laughing my heart out watching them trying to get the people to exchange their gold for gold bonds nobody budged nobody <laughs> budged uh, they then tried their hands with some of the bigger temples people also have a habit of uh, giving gold to the biggest temples like there is the one at tirupati which is supposed to have a huge hoard of gold they tried the hand with that they tried the hand with the ananta padmana padmanabha swami temple in tiruvananthapuram they tried all that these temples have huge stocks of gold but they also refused and eventually the the scheme fizzled out so in india the culture of holding gold is quite strong it's just a question of holding gold it's it's a cultural issue it's a religious issue and they just hold it and gifting it to your children is a big thing out here yeah no that's good uh, that might be one of the only thing kind of saving some people during this whole mon- demonetization is that they still have some wealth um that they they can just have um I know in India in the last few years there's been a lot of sort of attacks on on the gold market. Uh, I I don't know the exact details but I know they've sort of stopped uh the import of gold or uh you can explain probably a lot better than me what's been going on. No, it all started off with first of all uh, bringing in a sales tax on all transactions and um along with that they did another very um, interesting thing where they said that uh, actually it, it is all uh, revolving around the taxation. so uh, what they did was uh, they started insisting on the production of a pan card <coughs> the in, the uh, permanent account number with the income tax department so um, gold transactions beyond 20000 were reported to the income tax department i mean earlier the uh, gold uh, the sale was highly anonymous you could walk into a gold store, gold uh, uh, jewelry shop and you could just pick up whatever you wanted and walk out nobody would know you could walk in with bundles of cash hand it over and take your gold and go home but uh, with this um, a lot of restrictions came into the uh, purchase of gold so people started it basically made people wary because they were worried that if a uh, large purchases would be reported to the income tax department and that could bring a lot of scrutiny uh, to my income tax returns and therefore i i mean if if there's anything out there there's a lot of harassment that happens out here once you get into a scrutiny so people try to avoid that so that was a big pressure brought on to um, the on the individuals on the consumers who are trying to buy gold for their personal purposes on the business side basically the importation of gold was made uh, more difficult they started in, they brought in something called an 80 20 rule where you're supposed to i mean you, you could import if, if you were going to export you could import uh, 20% if you could we're going to exp- uh, 80% if you could imp- export 20%. So there was a lot of this, these rules that were brought in which are connected where they were trying to reduce the gold for storage purposes. Gold for uh, ornamental they were trying to reduce the consumption because they see it as unproductive use of capital. In fact um, um there are restrictions on where you can store gold. Today technically you're not supposed to store your gold let's say you own gold uh, um gold bars 
you're not supposed to store them in a bank locker. The gold, if located there, could be confiscated. So, well, yeah, I call, I, yeah, I call the uh, the government's use of money an unproductive use of 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 uh, <laughs> wealth of capital. Um, What's the situation on Bitcoin in India? Because with what's going on, obviously, right now, uh, this uh, would be a boon to people using Bitcoin and, and the growth of Bitcoin in India. I don't know anything about the... Uh, has, does anyone in India use it? Are there any regulations, anything like that? Um, while there aren't any regulations, its acceptance is uh, um, something I'm personally not heard of. Nobody in India announce, has announced... I don't think anyone announcing that they accept Bitcoin for various transactions. Somehow it's, um, I've, I've really not explored that area, but I have not come across any announcements. It's been, most transactions happen in uh, rupee terms. Gold, even gold is not used as a currency. It's used more as a protection, as a store of wealth, as a protection against inflation, but not exactly as a monetary unit. And uh, Bitcoin, while there are people investing, there are people, some, some, some among I mean, anarcho-capitalists who, who are aware of the government shenanigans and where the currency is headed, these are the people who try to invest abroad. So only those who manage to invest abroad outside India manage to lay their hands on Bitcoin. In India, Bitcoin transactions, as I see it, are actually minimal. Oh, that's interesting. That uh, definitely is an opportunity, I think, for some people. Uh, of course, it's going to be hard. It's, it sounds like it's very hard to do business in India, uh, just like it's hard to do business in the U.S. or a lot of Western countries. Uh, but uh, given what's going on, I, if I was a Bitcoin entrepreneur, I'd definitely be looking at India right now. It's definitely an opportunity. I have uh, no doubts about it. People are waiting. It's just a question of how do we get it um, into, a, in, into a money, something that can be exchanged for goods and services, um, that's what's actually holding people back. I mean, I would I would have done it if I had if I knew that I could use it as a currency out here. So. Yeah, well, uh, like even things like BitPay and stuff like that. So if I was BitPay, I'd be looking at or get looking at getting into India and trying to get a lot of companies to start accepting Bitcoin. If they accept Visa and Mastercard, they could accept Bitcoin, and then, uh, you know, this takes some time to develop. This is what uh, you know. It's a new new emerging uh, currency, but uh, definitely an opportunity for people out there. Um, so, uh, Bala, anything else you wanted to talk about uh, about India, about uh, your schools, about anything about Austrian economics? Anything you wanted to uh, talk about? Um, see, uh, uh, um, um, the area that fascinates me most is my school and the education that we try to offer. And that's an area that uh, I find a lot, very fascinating because education is something that uh, touches deep uh, into the heart of society. You know, when you educate someone, you actually shape the way people uh, think and the kind of thoughts that shape action in a society. And that's where I find uh, education especially fascinating. And that's why I'm in that space in the first place. Because to me, if uh, a, a, a hundred children were educated is hundred ambassadors for good ideas, spreading good ideas, spreading the ideas, maybe hopefully spreading the ideas of liberty and freedom. That's something that really fascinates me. So that's something I find uh, very exciting. And that's why I'm in that space. So. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I agree with you. I think it's very important. Uh, do you want to let people know about your school? Like if, if anyone's in India and, and wants to send their kids to your school? Sure. Uh, we are called Tatva. If you want to spell it, it's T-A-T-V-A, -T -A, Tatva School. Uh, we are located in the in one of the southern suburbs of Chennai. We are just off the, uh, the um, uh, arterial uh, old Mahabalipuram Road of Chennai where the IT corridor is located. We are, we are just a little off that. And uh, we are a, um, a Waldorf-inspired, Cambridge-affiliated uh, school. We are a Cambridge International School. Uh, we recently got a Cambridge International uh, School certification. And um, we currently have children. It's, a, it's an upcoming school. And uh, we uh, have children only up to the fifth grade. And we are growing. So that's where we are right now. And we are, trying, we are establishing a mark for ourselves as a very different education that's highly participative. It's, we, we try to make education fun for children. In fact, our motto is happy children become happy adults. We uh, keep the education a happy process where children participate, learn by participation, 
and uh, therefore learn better. That's a, that's and we, as I said, we're a Waldorf inspired school. We find a Waldorf school very inspiring in terms of its approach to education. While well, one may disagree with some of the philosophical aspects of the founders, the methodology of education we find it very very inspiring. It's we found uh, it uh, very impactful on the children, and that's uh, that's one of the things that distinguishes our whole system of education from almost all others available, at least in our city. That's great. Yeah, and as uh, Vladimir Lenin said, give me your child for four years and the seed I plant will never be uprooted. And unfortunately, most of them are in these government indoctrination camps where they come out of it, as Bella said, with an engineering degree and they can't do math and they can't read. Uh, and that's that's very typical, uh, even in the U.S., uh, a lot of people. Uh, so uh, it's great. All these alternative education systems totally support them. Uh, unschooling, Montessori schools, all those sort of things, anything other than government schools, really. Uh, and um, uh, and for people out there who are interested, uh, anarcho-capitalists out there, this is what we're all about, is, is creating value, trying to change the world by creating new systems, make the old systems obsolete, trying to create, as Bala is doing, a new education uh, system there in, in India. Um, if you're interested uh, in trying to get involved, uh, you should definitely join the Dollar Vigilante groups. Uh, so you just go to tdvgroups.com, and actually Bala is on our Chennai group. Uh, we have, have a number of groups in India. We have a number of groups around the world. A lot of people like Bala who are doing things. So, if, for example, if you're watching this, you're a big Bitcoin guy and you're like, yeah, I, I think I want to look at doing something in India, uh, you'll have access to people like Bali. You can go in there and ask him, what should I do? What, you know, what's going on on the ground? Maybe I can meet you when I'm there. Maybe you can introduce me to some people, things like that. Uh, so, and a Dollar Vigilante, basic, basic subscriptions, only $15 a month and you get access to all that, plus much, much more. Uh, so check that out if you're interested. And uh, also check out, coming up in uh, end of February, uh, Anarchapoco, uh, February 25th to 28th. We're going to have all kinds of people doing all kinds of amazing things from all around the world world, trying to uh, uh, change the world, trying to make this world a better place. Obviously, what's going on in India is very similar to what's going on in the West. Uh, the cracking down, trying to get everyone into the system, massive taxation system, tax everything, get uh, get rid of cash. This is a big part of the war on cash. I, I believe that's what, what's going on in India. Uh, and that's what anarcho-capitalists are doing, are creating things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies so that we, they can't fully control us and tax us and make us all slaves, which is what we mostly are today. Most people are slaves. Uh, we are owned by a very criminal organization called government and the people who control the governments and the central banks. Uh, until people realize that, the, you know, uh, that's what we're trying to do is help people realize that we really are slaves, uh, but we don't have to be. We can actually create a better world. So I'd like to thank Bala for coming on. I think it's late at night in India right now. Uh, I really appreciate him coming on. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, share down below. And that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. From Alcapulco, Mexico, this is Anarchast.